The Fry Corps were bands of paramilitary units that sprung up after the First World War was over in Weimar, Germany. Now, some historians claim that because of their right-wing ideology, these Fry Corps laid the foundation for National Socialism. So, who were they? Where did they come from? What did they war? Where did they fight? All these questions will be answered in this video. Because in this video, we're going to look at a very interesting army formation of the past. I'm talking about the Fry Corps. Hey, welcome back to the channel and welcome to another episode of Formation, the series where I discuss army formations of the past. If you find it interesting, please consider subscribing. Do not forget to hit the notification bell. To determine the origin of the Fry Corps, we need to go back to the spring of 1918. The First World War was still going on and Germany was in dire straits. Well, to be honest, actually, not only the German armies, also the French and the British armies were exhausted. However, the Germans gained a new enemy, the Americans, that poured into France. So the Germans could no longer play the waiting game. It was now or never, it was all or nothing. So in March 1918, the Germans unleashed the Spring Offensive. However, initially successful, it soon grinded to a halt. And the German armies were pushed back by the Allies in the Hundred Days Offensive. After the Battle of Amiens, August 1918, the German army commander spoke of the Black Day of the German army and from that point on it was all downhill. Now flash forward to November 1918, the German revolution occurred. Sailors in Kiel mutinied against their officers and soon the revolution spread inland. The German Kaiser abdicated, fled to the Netherlands and a new government was formed by Philip Scheidemann. Now on the 9th of November, Philip Scheidemann declared the German Republic and installed a provisional government. Two days later, the 11th, the armistice was signed and World War I was over. The violence, however, was not over. Communist sympathizers that were inspired by the Russian Revolution now filled the army bearers with red flags. They took over and caused mob violence. Apart from internal threats, there were also external threats for Germany. Because now new nations were created. Czechoslovakia, Poland was reborn. And these countries demanded territory that previously had belonged to Germany. German army leaders were conservative and nationalistic and they wanted to preserve Germany. Now mid December 1918 German general George Marker came with the idea of the Free Corps and recruited men from his own division. Soon other German army commanders around Berlin took the same initiative. According to historian Robert Gerward the name Freikor was a name coined during the anti-Napoleonic Wars of Liberation when German volunteers spurred on by Prussia's military humiliation at the hands of the French made a significant contribution to Napoleon's eventual defeat. The weapons used by the Freikor were the weapons from Germany during World War I. Most used was the Mauser Gewehr 98. Furthermore, they made use of the Luger pistol, the Mauser C-96, the MP-18, the Karabiner 98A, which should not be confused with its 1930 successor, the Karabiner 98K. They had steel handgranaten as well as heavy machine guns, flamethrowers and armored cars. Some even made use of tanks. Since the Freikorps originated from the German army, they wore German late war uniforms. Most of them wore the M16 tunic with patis or jackboots and the M16 steel helmet. Some soldiers painted a skull on their helmet. Troops of Marinebrigade Erhard had swastikas painted on their helmets and were the first Germans to do so. Hitler's movement would later adopt this symbol. Since the German army had fallen apart at the end of the war, we see a variety of uniforms since there were many different Freikorps which had their own modified tunics and rank distinction. Now, if you want to know more about that, you can do some further research in the description. You see some sources for that. So what did these Freikorps want? Well, basically their goal was twofold. First, they wanted to protect Germany from internal 
enemies, and I'm talking about left-wing sympathizers, communists. And second, they wanted to preserve Germany from external threats. I already mentioned Czechoslovakia and Poland, newborn nations after the First World War. They wanted land that previously belonged to the German Empire because they believed it was rightfully theirs. The Freikorps took part in a whole string of conflicts, so let's take a look. The Spartacist uprising occurred early January 1919 and was led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht of the Spartacist League, which was by now called the German Communist Party, the KPD. They started a demonstration and an armed group of Spartacists took control of the newspaper building of the German Social Democrat Party. Also, they occupied surrounding buildings. Now, note here that the power base of these communists was very small. Nevertheless, German Chancellor Friedrich Ebert had seen what happened in Russia. So he wanted to subdue this threat as quickly as possible. And therefore, he asked the Freikorps to do it. Now, note here that these Freikorps were not pro-Weimar Republic. They were very right-wing themselves and they were against the Social Democrats. However, these Freikorps were also very much against communists. So therefore, these Freikorps moved in and they crushed the Spartacist uprising and Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were arrested and killed shortly after. Now this sparked other left-wing rebellions in Germany where short-lived socialist republics were proclaimed in Bremen as well as in Bavaria. Now the Freikorps they moved up to crush these socialist states. In 1920 the Freikorps fought in the Ruhr Valley against the Red Ruhr Army. So why were these Freikorps so successful? The Freikorps victory were due to a great extent to their unquestionable military superiority over the various red militias which faced them. Although the Freikorps were greatly outnumbered in Berlin, Munich and the Ruhr, they enjoyed advantages in discipline, high motivation, competent and resolute leadership and tactical experience. They won even though most of these operations involved street fighting for which the Imperial Army was not trained. Their opponents often broke when confronted by the acid tests of an energetic and well-organized assault. Now I've mentioned before, the Freikorps did not crush these communist rebellion out of sympathy for the Weimar government. And this became painfully clear in 1920 when the Kaputsch occurred. Now the Kaputsch was a right-wing coup attempt. According to the Treaty of Versailles, the German army had to be shrunk to only 100,000 men. Now this meant that this Freikorps had to be disbanded. And Marine Brigade Erhard resisted against this and marched to Berlin. There, they tried to hold power. Yet the workers of Berlin turned out to be loyal to the Weimar government and they went into a strike. So, therefore, in Berlin, there was no running water, no electricity and no transport. In other words, Berlin was down and the Kaputsch was done for. A couple of years later, 1923, Adolf Hitler tried to gain power in Munich, was known as the Bierkeller Putsch. This Putsch also failed. The German Freikorps also fought outside the German borders, for example in the newly created Poland. The Polish nation was reborn in November 1918. In the West, the Greater Poland Uprising and the Silesian Uprisings against German militias and troops secured the western borders of the newborn Second Polish Republic. I covered these conflicts in separate episodes, so check these out. The Freikorps also fought in the Baltic Wars of Independence. Now, I also made separate videos about the Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian Wars of Independence. These conflicts were very complicated because they involved many different parties, among which the German Freikorps who fought against the Baltic Bolsheviks. It also here that the Freikorps showed their darkest side. 
When the German unit, which was a combination of Freikorps of the Iron Division and as well as the Baltic Landeswehr, an army formation which consisted of Baltic Germans, entered the Latvian capital of Riga, they killed many unarmed young women because they accused them of being Bolshevik. On the Latvian countryside, many Latvian citizens fell prey to the Freikorps taste for blood. After years of war, these men were scarred and all the hatred and frustration came out. Many Freikorps member would later become a member of the SA, which was a Freikorps in and of itself. Some Freikorps members joined the Nazi party, since these Freikorps members were right wing. Later, in 1938, there was a Sudeten crisis and we saw the pro-German Freikorps Sudetenland. But that is a story for another time. Thanks to my patrons, you see on screen, and a special thanks to Henry Clarkson, Cooling Castleman, the President, Michael Nozak, and Wombat Cookie. If you want to support me, go to the link in the description. Now, if you want to know more about the chaotic interwar period, I have a playlist for you right here. I want to thank you for watching. Do not forget to subscribe. See you later.